Thank you to everyone who has joined this um, webcast with Sky and Contiki. Um, as, as some of you will have heard before, uh, we are a global emerging markets fund. Uh, we practice a um, very strict value-based uh, investment philosophy uh, based on our own proprietary analysis. Uh, we're a dedicated team to the strategy. Uh, there's four of us, two portfolio managers, Katrine Geta and myself, and we have two analysts supporting us in Espen Klette and Desmond Wee. So in that way, we maintain sort of the coverage of the investment universe that's available to us while also being able to closely follow up the portfolio companies. Um, we also do a number of these regular updates now over the last 18 months. And um, if you have missed any of them or you want to see anything else that we've talked about in that period, they are all available on our YouTube channel uh, of the Skagen Funds uh, on that website. So please have a look if, if that's of interest. Um, and then if we look at what's happened since our last update in the middle of June, it's been a relatively challenging five months for emerging markets. The fund itself is down about 4% in, in euro terms, and that's predominantly due to that market weakness. Um, you can see on the right hand side that as of the end of October, emerging markets equities have lagged developed markets and the major markets of the US and Europe by, uh, by approximately 20 percentage points so far this year. Uh, the fund also lost some relative performance uh, over the summer as some of our Korean and Chinese holdings continued uh, to struggle. If you look at the end of October, uh, the fund is up about 5% in, in euro terms, but as of yesterday, the fund is up 7%, some 2.5 percentage points behind the benchmark. So what I want to cover today is, is to give a performance update, what's driven the, the markets uh, since our last update and, and year to date. Uh, secondly, I want to touch about, uh, highlight some of the changes that we've made to the portfolio and how we are positioned as of today. And then finally cover a few thoughts on what will impact the, the outlook as we look uh, into next year. So if we start with uh, why has emerging markets been weaker than developed markets so far this year, we think there are a few uh, key reasons. Number one is that there's been a generally weaker recovery from uh, the COVID pandemic, particularly where there have been lower vaccine rates in some uh, emerging economies. As a result, the growth differential in, in GDP growth is about one percentage point in favor of emerging economies this year versus the more normal two percentage point level. So see the additional growth delivered by emerging markets is lower than it is in a typical year. Secondly, uh, there's been a significant amount of regulatory tightening in China, especially in the technology and internet sectors, which has hurt a lot of uh, those larger companies. There's also in China been growing concerns over the Chinese property market and the sustainability of some of that debt-driven model, particularly of the property developers, uh, such as Evergrande, which has been in the news. And this is an important part of the Chinese economy, which directly and indirectly accounts for close to 30% of GDP. Finally, and more recently, we've seen rising inflation, particularly within food and energy basket. And this does hit emerging economies harder, where they make up a bigger proportion of people's um, spending. That has already led to some monetary tightening in certain countries, uh, and that has had a negative impact on some of those equity markets. So in summary, uh, so far this year, there has been more uncertainty in emerging economies relative to more developed markets. If you look at some examples of that, you can clearly see the impact of regulatory tightening in China and how it has affected Chinese equities. As of the end of October, uh, the MSC China index was down 9% in euro terms, with the property and internet sectors down 26% and 34% respectively. Um, as the sell-off accelerated over the summer, there was some impact on the fund, as I uh, highlighted, uh, but because we had been relatively cautiously positioned in our Chinese exposure, we, have, we avoided the worst of the drawdown. Uh, but as I'll return to later on in the presentation, 
we believe that the sell-off has created opportunities to pick up some quality companies at much, much lower prices than they have historically traded at. Um, when it comes to rising inflation, it's clear both on the producer side here in the green line uh, from China, but also on the consumer side in the blue line uh, for US CPI. Both are at near the highest levels in the last 30 years and has gotten people uh, wondering about how permanent it will be. Uh, it's not clear uh, to us at least what the transitory elements are and what will prove stickier, but it's clear that it's become a key issue for investors across the world. As you see on the right hand side, a lot of it has driven by higher commodity prices, especially within energy, uh, which has more than doubled over the last 12 months, both across oil, natural gas and coal. We see this impact on returns by country and by sectors. So on the left hand side, you can see that the highest returning countries are those that benefit from higher energy prices, such as Russia and Norway. We've also seen good returns in India so far this year. And this country has in many ways benefited from investors reducing exposure to China as it has fallen and have been looking for a safer haven instead. At the bottom of the chart, you can see that countries more vulnerable to higher inflation, such as Turkey and Brazil, as well as China, which I mentioned earlier, have been hit harder. By sector, uh, the large weighting of Chinese companies, both in consumer discretionary, um, which is the large part of the internet sector, but also the real estate sector, has meant that returns here have been weaker. And unsurprisingly, given what's happened to commodity prices, uh, both energy and materials have done very, very well so far this year. It's also reflected in our portfolio returns. Uh, four of the five weakest contributors year to date are related to China or to Brazil, um, while the land-based salmon producer Atlantic Sapphire has had company-specific issues with the scaling of its US operations. In the top five on the positive contributors, our holdings in India and Russia have performed very well, as well as our Canadian listed copper producer, Ivanhoe Mines, uh, whose flagship uh, project in the Democratic Republic of Congo became operational ahead of schedule. If we turn to the portfolio as it stands uh, today, at the aggregate level, there's no change to the key characteristics of the portfolio. On the left hand side, you can see that we maintain a high active share of almost 90%, uh, yet it's a balanced portfolio across countries, sectors, and as you can see on the right hand side, also across market capitalizations. We maintain a near 60% exposure to small and mid cap companies, where we see a number of opportunities at the current valuation levels. Also, I want to stress that the fund has followed the same value-based investment philosophy since its launch 19 and a half years ago. And you can see in the middle part of the uh, chart, it's clearly visible in the multiples of earnings, eight times earnings for this year and one times price to book multiple that the portfolio trades at, which is an approximately 40% discount to the wider EM universe and our benchmark index. Under the surface, we've made a number of changes to the portfolio this year. There are eight new companies that have come in and 11 positions that we have exited. Um, those that are more highlighted on the chart are the changes that we've made since our last update in June. Um, so I'll focus on this rather than go through the whole list. So firstly, we sold Tech Mahindra after it went through our target price. Uh, you may recall in an earlier update that we, that we bought this stock in May of last year. And since then, it's returned about 150% uh, in those 18 months and has been the top five contributor in the portfolio this year. So we sold it as it reached what we feel felt was the right potential for the stock. We did have some exposure to Chinese property sector at the start of the year. Uh, Just Bon on the top right hand side is a property management company which was acquired by a competitor uh, and yielded a return of about 50% over a short period of time. So it shows that it is possible to make money in this sector, uh, despite the negative headlines that um, are around it at the moment. We also, since the last update, sold out of Bank of China, not because it hit our target price, uh, but, be but because it had yielded 15% total return this year, predominantly through the dividend. 
uh, and this was in a market that was clearly down, as I showed earlier. So therefore, we simply recycled the money from Bank of China into what we felt were more compelling risk reward opportunities. And on top of that, we've made a number of smaller adjustments to the portfolio um, of smaller uh, positions. In terms of what came in, we have two new holdings in Russia. Firstly, the grocery retailer Magnit, uh, which we believe has reached an inflection point in terms of its operations. We know the sector well, having already invested successfully in X5, which remains in the portfolio. We also invested in um, um, investment company Sistema, which we believe has an undervalued investment portfolio. And most importantly, the stock has a number of triggers for monetization of that portfolio, some of which we've already seen this year through IPO of subsidiaries. We also use some of the money that we freed up from Bank of China to increase our Chinese positions that we had recently initiated in Alibaba and the oil company Sinuk. On the back of those changes, there has been an increase in our exposure to China. This is something that you should expect given how much more attractively valued the market has become and the sell-off that we've seen. We are value-driven and price-driven investors uh, with a contrarian uh, approach. So when we see the kind of drawdowns that we have seen, we are happy to go against um, the crowd. We've also had an increase in our Russian exposure, partly because of strong performance highlighted earlier, but also because of the two names that we have added to the portfolio. This has come at the expense of our exposure in India. You may recall this was a very strongly performing market uh, where we have seen uh, a lot of gains already. And as I mentioned, we've exited Tech Mahindra after it reached our target price. We also earlier in the year in the first quarter locked in some profits on some of our Korean holdings, which uh, performed extremely well in the fourth quarter of last year and the first quarter this year, and therefore reduced our exposure somewhat there. We get a lot of questions on why we've increased our exposure to China, uh, given the negative news flow and the perceived higher risk. Um, so we'll try and spend a little bit of time to explain our thinking and approach around this. So firstly, we're long-term fundamental investors. So that basically means we believe we have time on our side. We fear the loss of value, not necessarily volatility. We believe in the long-term value creation that is happening in China. There are lots of good, if not great companies with strong competitive positions and clearly huge market opportunities. Many of these companies have competent management teams and we see long-term opening of the capital markets as inevitable. So over time, this value creation will be reflected in share prices and how often you check these share prices will influence how you feel about China at any given point in time. So we take the example of the last 20 years to look at MSCI China and you only looked at the starting point and the end point over that 20 year period, you'll see that you've made an eight times return or 11% annualized returns in US dollars. This is higher than the MSCI All Country World Index and clearly represents what would have been a good allocation. If you check that over five year periods, it's also positive in each of those five year periods. But as you can see, there are very different periods during that 20 years overall period. If you look at the period 2005 to 2010, you made two and a half times your money or 20% per annum. Whereas in the following five years between 2010 and 2015, the return was only 1% per annum in US dollars. So clearly how you feel about China in those two periods will be pretty different. But what happens if we zoom in and look at that best five year period and look at it on a daily basis? It's a lot more volatile. So we remember that this deliver this period delivered 20% return per annum, two and a half times your money over five years. But even in that period, we have a drawdown from peak to bottom in 2007-8 of 73%. Clearly that return came at um, a cost of great volatility. And how you need to think about China is how you um, engage with the market at levels like that. If we take that full 20 year period that we've talked about, we can see that MSCI China every single year has fallen at some point from its 
um, highest point every single year for 20 years. And despite that, the annual returns have compounded very, very strongly. So when you look at the 30% correction that we've seen this year alone, it's not even in the top five over the last 20 years. Uh, and therefore we think that it does present a good opportunity. When you look at our top 12 holdings as it stands today, it shouldn't be surprising that you see four Chinese companies out of the top 12. On the whole, these are quality companies in our view that most other investors were happy to own just 12 months ago at higher prices, but now are increasingly out of favor because of what's happening around them and the price action that they've lived through. They have gotten significantly cheaper during this drawdown. That better reflects the current risks as perceived by other investors, but it no longer, in our view, gives the same weight to their long-term attractive fundamentals, which in many instances haven't changed. So we've been able to buy leading internet companies like Alibaba and Tencent, Tencent through the process holding company at very discounted valuations, as well as the leading offshore oil and gas producer, CNUC, as it's been included, excluded from the MSCI index uh, provider, therefore also creating a technical buying opportunity. In our view, these companies complement the portfolio through higher returns on equity, higher growth, and in many ways, higher quality than what was there before. And they have not altered the overall value char characteristics of the portfolio, which continues to trade at single digit PE and just one times uh, price to book. But there was one company that was already in the portfolio at the start of the year, which has also uh, suffered in the drawdown. Uh, it's Ping An, and we want to go through the case again, just to give a little bit in terms of comfort of why we've been increasing our position during the course of the summer. So as many of you will know, Ping An is one of the largest financial groups in the world. It's headquartered in the tech hub of Shenzhen. Unsurprisingly, therefore, the company uses technology actively. We think it gives the company a competitive advantage it, of both lower costs, but also significant cross-selling opportunities as it combines insurance, banking, asset management, and fintech across its various platforms. You can see here that the platform combines those um, into one uh, user base. They have about 650 million users across the various platforms. This company is a quality company and it's no secret. Uh, that's not why we bought it because no one has seen what we've seen. Uh, it has consistently been ranked highly both in terms of industry awards, but also in terms of what it has delivered for consumers. It's delivered for consumers and it's delivered for shareholders. The company IPO'd in 2004 and has since then grown down a compound rate of 20% per annum while reaching a near 20% average return on equity. And up until the end of this year, that was also reflected in its um, delivery for shareholders. Uh, between the IPO in 2004 and the end of 2020, uh, the stock had compounded total returns at 20% per annum for a 23 times gain. But this year, um, as at the end of October, the stock is down 39%, predominantly due to weak premium income growth, but also because of its investment book exposure to the real estate sector, which I mentioned earlier. I think it's worth bearing in mind here that real estate makes up about 6% of the company's investment book. They have no exposure to Evergrande, uh, but they do have investments in the sector across debt, equity, and real asset investments. So in many ways, it's a diversified real estate portfolio and appropriate for a long-term investment book like that of an insurance company. So while the premium income can be volatile, if we focus on the big picture and the huge market opportunity as insurance penetration grows with income growth in China, uh, we also have long-term favorable demographics uh, due to an aging population and more focus on um, providing for one's own health. I mentioned that the company has 650 million users across its platforms. Of those, 225 million are customers of financial products. And still at this point in time, the net number of new customers is growing by about 15 million per annum. And we think this is key to focus on because what drives the long-term earnings power of this company? 
it's clearly the number of customers, it's the number of contracts each customer signs, and it's the profit per contract that those customers have bought. And we see that the cross-selling platform works. The number of contracts per customer continues to grow every single year, and it means that they are buying more and more products for Ping An every single year. We also see that the retail profit per contract is relatively stable over time, and as a result, there should be no doubt as to what is driving the profit growth of the company beyond the number of customers. And we see that the company, despite what has been a tough year where the share price is corrected by 39%, the year-over-year -year growth and operating profit is still positive because of these fundamental drivers. And in the same way that MSCI China index has fallen every single year uh, over the last 20 years and delivered strong returns despite that, um, Ping An has also been a volatile stock at times. And if you look over the last 10 years, it's also suffered regular drawdowns, many similar in size to what we had uh, so far this year. And despite this, the stock has delivered, even on a trailing five-year basis, very strong um, annualized returns. And what we have now in terms of situation is that um, it's currently trading on six times earnings with a dividend yield of almost 5% which means that unlike in previous periods, we can afford to be patient uh, for these long-term compounding characteristics to play through. Uh, there is nothing in the price today for this long-term growth. Okay, if we turn to the outlook for the portfolio and some of the things that we are thinking about, I said earlier that inflation is top of mind for investors. It's also a key consideration for us. Um, what we have today is an unusual market backdrop in our view, a combination of high and rising uh, consumer price inflation and rock bottom interest rates is very unusual. In fact, if you look at previous periods where core US CPI has been running in the 4 to 5% range, you would expect long dated treasuries or 10 year yields to be closer to 5, 6% than the 1.6% that we currently have. There is clearly here from this data that the market is in many ways saying that the inflation is most likely transitory or that there are other factors at play. We saw at the start of the year what can happen when the market changes it, its mind uh, about inflation and requests a higher discounting rate where we saw a significant drawdown in long duration assets, including growth stocks. So we want to go through a little bit what we think are more um, less transitory inflation drivers. And one of them is um, in terms of the green transition. This has got nothing to do with supply chain bottlenecks and some sort of short term squeezes in commodity prices, which we uh, believe are transitory. But here are some of the uh, forces driving prices higher in certain areas of the economy that we think are longer lasting because of the political will and the investment enthusiasm uh, behind the green transition. So we've previously highlighted our expo exposure to the green transition and electrification as early as 2018. Amongst other things, we built that through copper producers where we saw that an excel likely accelerating demand with a limited supply response, at least in the time frame that most people invest in, uh, would drive prices higher. But renewable energy production is on the whole more resource intensive to build than fossil fuel counterparts. You can see on the left hand side that it is more intensive in, in terms of building materials that goes in per unit of energy produced, but also in terms of the lifetime energy multiplier of what you need to put in versus what you get out is significantly lower for renewable energies, which is where the focus is at the moment. So we believe that there is a risk that we are underestimating the amount of inputs that need to go in in order to deliver the green transition that we are all hoping will play out. The other driver or the flip side of this is that the supply side of non-renewable energy uh, has clearly been impacted by investor and government pressures and consumer pressures um, in terms of in, um, asset allocations here. However, we need to remember that more than 80% of energy production globally still comes from non-renewable sources, 
and will remain a part of the energy transition for years to come, regardless of whether or not we want it to. And what we've seen, though, is that during this period in the last few years, the reduction in investments in non-renewable energy has been accompanied by higher return hurdle rates. And Goldman Sachs estimates that offshore oil projects, as an example, that were sanctioned last year, had a projected IRR of more than 20%, which is up from 11% just 10 years ago, and it compares with roughly 4% for renewables. It's clearly everyone's intention to cur curb unsustainable energy development, and but the problem is that such high project returns, which are now being demanded, can only be achieved through higher prices. So the higher the bar that one sets for our transition to transition away from uh, fossil fuel investments, the higher the prices of some of those inputs need to go. Now, the pushback one would get on that is clearly, well, the demand will fall rapidly as we, for example, get the adoption of electric vehicles, which we've talked about many times. But many of the projections for the energy transition are based on these rapidly falling demand scenarios, which may or may not pass. Um, it's clearly what we hope for. But if one looks to Norway as an example, which we know pretty well here at Skagen, we have the highest EV penetration in the world and 60% of new cars sold so far this year are fully electric. Despite this, and despite an incentive system for electric vehicles that few other countries can afford, fuel consumption in Norway has not fallen at all over the last 10 years. Now, this is clearly because it takes time to change the entire car park. This is not a game just about uh, new vehicles, but it is worth bearing in mind when we construct a portfolio if that we have increased demand for the materials we need to deliver the green transition is fueling rising metal prices for those metals that are needed. And an overestimation of the fall in fossil fuel demand that would lead to an underinvestment in non-renewable sources and therefore higher energy prices, then some of these forces may become inflationary over time and may have been uh, underappreciated by investors. In a historical perspective, if such a scenario were to play out, the playbook is unsurprisingly to have exposure to commodities, to have exposure to energy producers. After all, it's the prices of their products which are going up and driving potential inflation. You can also see that the loss of purchasing power of cash is not surprising. And we see that long duration assets or growth stocks tend to fare poorly, often because the starting valuation points are high as we go into periods where inflation surprises on the upside, not too dissimilar to where we are today. Um, the flip side of that is we also see that value stocks, which is what we're focusing on, and emerging markets where there is a bigger uh, collection of raw materials and energy dependency in terms of the market structure, also did well both in the 1970s, but also more recently in the early 2000s, according to a Bank of America study. And when we see the setup for value stocks in emerging markets, we see that it's attractive also because the starting low valuations in a historical perspective. If you look within emerging markets, value stocks have been falling in relative valuation almost for 10 years now and trade at a 50% discount, both on earnings and on price to book relative to their higher growth peers. We also see that the significant underperformance of EM equities, not just this year, but also over the last 10 years, have left them trading at very extended discount to developed markets and the US in particular, which has continued to deliver very, very strong returns. So if we look at the last 10 years, the excessive optimism that had been baked into EM equities post the financial crisis, where everyone wanted to talk about decoupling and BRICS, that forced those kind of companies to trade on par with developed markets. As the disappointment came through, the discount has grown a greater and greater during this cycle. And we are back at the level we were nearly 20 years ago when the fund was launched to look for value opportunities in these cheap and in many instances forgotten markets. I also just before I finish up, I just want to highlight we are not macro investors. We're not building a 
inflation portfolio or any other sort of single uh, forecasting uh, that we pin the portfolio on. We don't know how to forecast inflation. We talk about some of the drivers and how we understand them. And there are many other macro variables that we don't try and forecast. What we do, however, is we use common sense when we strike construct our portfolio and we try to have multiple legs to stand on and that we can deliver in a number of scenarios. If you look at the portfolio as it stands today, the top left hand quadrant, which is about 30 percent of our portfolio, is in sectors like technology, consumer discretionary, which typically do benefit from rising economic growth and low inflation. So the kind of environment that we have grown accustomed to. If you look further down on the left hand side, roughly 26% of the portfolio is more defensively tilted. This is predominantly in healthcare, in consumer staples and in telecoms. And if you look on the right hand side of the chart, you'll see that just over 40% of the portfolio is allocated to sectors that should benefit either from higher rates or from higher uh, commodity prices. So here we're talking about sectors such as basic materials, energy and financials. Each company on that chart is picked on its own uh, merit. We see good risk reward in the individual names, but together we believe that they uh, complement each other and build a diversified and most importantly attractively valued portfolio. In summary, um, Skagen Kontiki, it is a very actively managed global emerging markets fund. We are long term orientated and fundamental in our approach based on our own proprietary analysis and a clear value based investment philosophy. The portfolio is concentrated. We have about 47 names in the portfolio at the moment uh, and each company is there on their own merit uh, being uh, undervalued on uh, absolute return basis or fundamental basis and often unpopular for what we believe to be temporary reasons. We think that the backdrop is pretty attractive uh, both from a valuation perspective but also because of the drawdown that we've suffered this year which has created a number of dislocations in the markets uh, which we think uh, gives us opportunities as we look into next year. So with that, I thank everyone for the attention. And if Ulitistan has uh, received any questions, we will be very happy to take those.